Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord our God, for God is good, God's steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord? Or who can declare all the praise due to the Lord? Blessed be the Lord of Israel. Let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. With you and also with you. We welcome you to this service of August 2nd. It is a virtual communion Sunday and if you have not prepared elements at uh, your home for everyone in your household, I would urge you to give a pause button to your YouTube uh, virtual worship and uh, prepare those elements so that at the appropriate time you can partake of the uh, bread and the cup when it is uh, the communion portion of this service. We hope that you feel the presence of Christ throughout the worship service, but especially as we take communion together. So let us prepare our hearts and our minds to confess our sins before God.
With confidence in God's grace, let us pray. God of mercy, you call us again and again to take a hold of life, promising that in the midst of our struggles, you will be strength and stay. We have been timid disciples, slow to serve you and reluctant to share the good news of your love. Lord, have mercy on us by your spirit, fill us with renewed desire to do your will and speak your word of kindness and reconciliation. For the sake of Christ we pray, amen. If anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creature. The past is finished, all things are renewed. Believe and share the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. The Old Testament lectionary for this Sunday is in Genesis chapter 32. 
Within the words of the Torah, listen for the word of God. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to meet his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have lived with Laban as an alien, staying until now, and I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female slaves, and I have sent to tell my lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. The messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and four hundred men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies, thinking, If Esau comes to the one company and destroys it, then the company that is left will escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, Return to your own country, to your own kindred, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the steadfast love and the faithfulness you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan and now have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all, the mothers with the children. Yet you have said, I surely will do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because of their number. So he spent that night there, and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 10 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. These he delivered into the hand of his servants, every drove by itself and said to his servants, pass on ahead of me and put a space between the droves and the droves. And he instructed the foremost, when Esau my brother meets you and asks you, to whom do you belong and where are you going and whose are these ahead of you, you shall say, they belong to your servant Jacob and they are a present to my lord Esau. Moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you meet him and you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For Jacob thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterward I shall see his face, and perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him, and he spent himself that night in the camp. That same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything he had. Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him in the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then the man said, Let me go, for day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So the man said, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humanity and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip, Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket because Jacob was struck on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation within each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's a mysterious aspect to the story of Jacob's wrestling match on the banks of the creek called the Jabbok. With whom was he wrestling? A man, so says the text, yet implying that 
Somehow he is an agent of God. The passage in Genesis displays an evidence of a long history of oral transmission before ever being committed to paper, like an old house that has been remodeled over the years with subtractions and additions and new elements. And as Old Testament scholar Gerhard von Rad notes, this indicates an authentically ancient origin. The night of grappling comes on the banks of the Jabbok, a stream that cuts through a narrow, deep ravine, creating a dangerous crossing, which would have explained why Jacob wanted his family to cross before him, and he crossed last. But more important than the geographical location of this story is the location of the event within the life span of this man, Jacob because this was to become a watershed event for him. Up until that moment, Jacob had lived a life that was rather true to his name. Jacob had been a cheater all his life, a character flaw that was predicted when he was named Jacob at birth, which reveals his character. Now, who would name a baby cheater? Well, actually, the literal name Jacob means heel grabber, and they named him that because he had a hold of his twin brother Esau's heel when he was born. But heel grabbing is an illegal wrestling maneuver, and so by implication it means conniver, cheater. Now the question that is raised in this text is whether Jacob can ever amount to anything other than a conniving trickster. Or as the prophet Jeremiah asked, can a leopard change its spots? Jacob was on his way to his home country, returning to native land where 20 years earlier he had cheated his brother Esau out of a blessing and an inheritance. So he sent gifts ahead of himself to appease Esau's justified anger. Now as the day turns to dusk and the family is making the crossing at the Jabbok. Jacob is about to follow when suddenly, in the gathering darkness of night, strong arms wrestle him to the ground. He cannot see his assailants in the pitch darkness of the night, and neither is able to gain victory. Jacob had not been looking for such an encounter. It was thrust upon him, an interruption in his intended journey, but it is exactly, you see, what Jacob needed, a change in the direction of his life an alteration in his character. Jacob was accustomed to pulling the strings to gain advantage. That's what he did with his uncle Laban, and that's the way Jacob became rich. Now he's engaged in a tussle that wears on through the night. Who was the opponent in this wrestling match? As I said, the text is rather ambiguous, and that, that is what we often find true in our own lives, is it not? The ways of God and the agents that God uses to accomplish changes in our lives, in the direction we need, it's not always clear to us, is it? Life would be a much simpler matter, would it not, if we could know with perfect clarity what God's perspective is? But we don't. Various interpretations of who this mysterious wrestler is, have been offered through the centuries. Perhaps this was an angelic presence whose power would be diminished with daybreak, like a vampire's. Or perhaps the man was none other than Esau, acting on God's behalf and needing to flee before dawn to avoid recognition. Or a more modern Jungian interpretation is that Jacob was wrestling with his own shadow self, grappling in convulsive agony with a conscience that was plagued with guilt and fear. The glow of the sun appears over the eastern horizon. Jacob's opponent tries to flee, but Jacob demands a blessing before letting go. Jacob's still looking out for himself, of course. He knows his wrestling foe possesses some 
inscrutable power and he wants to obtain a portion of that power before he is going to face the justified wrath of Esau. In response to Jacob's request, the unknown wrestler says, what is your name? Hmm. Hmm. To give his name, Jacob will have to admit his flaw, for his name means heel grabber, cheater. If Jacob is to obtain this blessing, it will be with an honest admission, unlike the blessing he obtained 20 years earlier when he went into his father, old blind Esau, old blind Isaac, sorry, Isaac. And Isaac had said to Jacob, what is your name? And Jacob had replied, I am Esau. And with a false identity, he stole Esau's blessing. Jacob had come face to face with a confrontation that was from God, whoever the wrestler was. Through the wrestler, God was grappling with Jacob, and Jacob was grappling with God. Not literally, of course. God's involvement in the world, as we are told in the Westminster Confession of 1646, is through other people and events. Jacob had been fearing meeting with Esau, but before he can get to that encounter, he needs to face something about himself. And as a result of this night-long bout, Jacob finds his hip is permanently out of socket, and he walks away from the jabbok with a limp. He was wounded while wrestling. He limped every day after that to show others and to show himself that there are no untroubled victories in this life. And for all of us who are finally honest before God and ourselves, we will find some limps or scars that we have accumulated along the way because we have feet of clay. We are not perfect, paradoxically. We are stronger in character precisely when we admit our weaknesses rather than cling to a facade of invulnerability. Jacob's limp, I believe, anticipates the cross of Jesus Christ and all the crosses for those who follow Jesus. Discipleship in Christ's kingdom means claiming the weakness of that cross. The wounds of Jesus' hand and feet are reminders that victory is never cheap and surely among the most important tasks that we can claim as human beings is to become more like Christ and more human and therefore to embrace those limps. Embracing our limps, I think, is precisely what Paul was urging his fellow Christians in Rome in the epistle reading that Christopher Peters used a week ago, Romans 5, that we rejoice in suffering, for suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. Character. Well, that's a term that can be used rather negatively, as in, boy, that guy is quite a character. But when we say character counts, we mean it, we mean it positively. Often, to gain positive character, our character as a person must undergo a transformation, and that's what happens for Jacob. Limping toward his meeting with Esau, having endured an all-night struggle of body and soul, Jacob leaves the banks of the Jabbok, which he renames Peniel, or the face of God, because Jacob believes he has had a face-to-face -face encounter with God. Jacob, who was more clever than he was intelligent, says the biblical equivalent of Dorothy's, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. When Jacob says, truly God was in this place and I didn't know it. To which all the angels in heaven cried, well, duh. Whenever and wherever we wrestle toward the realization of potential growth and goodness, God is surely in that place. So the place of Jabbok is renamed and Jacob is renamed. No longer Jacob the cheater, but Israel, which literally means he who wrestles with God. 
That's what Israel means. Wrestles with God. Jacob goes on toward the meeting with Esau, but it's clear that he's changed. And though everyone in the story still calls him Jacob, the, the new name doesn't stick until it sticks as the children of Israel. But in his struggle on the banks of the Jabbok, he is an indeed a changed man. He would approach Esau with humility rather than fear. The presence he had sent on ahead to Esau became gifts, truly gifts, rather than tools of manipulation. Jacob's past, even though it was entrenched in decades of habitual misbehavior, was not going to imprison his future. My friends, the leopard's spots had changed. Our moments of struggle toward the dawn of truth may never be presented quite as dramatically as Jacob's night at the Jabbok. Yet advance in the life of the Spirit, in character, does come when we, like Jacob, have wrestled with God and wrestled with ourselves and finding in the wounds of that wrestling the strength to go on. Amen. According to the Gospel of Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples in Emmaus, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he blessed and broke it. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table, and I pray that we will recognize his presence among us as we commune in faith together. And our Savior invites all those who trust in him to share in this feast at which he is the host. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right, our good thing and our bounden duty, as well as our highest joy, to offer you 
praise and thanksgiving wherever your glory abides. For, Lord God, you made this world and all that is in it. You gave us the gifts that sustain life, the air we breathe, the water we drink, and from your good hand, the food that nourishes us. You made the world good. Yet, we, your people, perverted it. And you sent prophets to call us back to your way of justice and truth and peace. And then in the fullness of time, Lord God, you sent your only begotten Son to be born in great humility, to begin a ministry among the poor, the needy, the outcast, healing the sick and befriending sinners. And then, obeying you, Jesus took up his cross and went to Golgotha where he was murdered by people he loved. We thank you that he is not dead but has risen to rule the world and is still the friend of sinners. And we trust that in your coming kingdom we will celebrate his victory over sin and death with him. For great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Now, gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of field and vineyard that they may be for us a participation in the unique and unrepeatable event of Christ's broken body and shed blood. We give you thanks for your spirit among us and among all your people throughout the earth who also confess your name and who pray with us the prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We do this according to Christ's example and his appointment. For on the night of his arrest, our Savior took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this, remembering me. Let us partake of the bread together. In the same manner, our Savior took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the New Testament, sealed in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do this, remembering me. Let us partake of the cup. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for the privilege you have given us of sharing in this Holy Supper with your Son, Jesus, who is truly present, who renews our strength as an eagle, and who equips us for life eternal in heaven with you. And we pledge ourselves in faith to you, for in this supper you have given Jesus to us. Amen. Gracious God, we are here to praise you and to express joy and thanksgiving for the gifts you shower on us. We thank you for this loving congregation, for family and friends and all those who enrich our lives, and for the wonder of living in your magnificent world. We are ever amazed at the complexity, the power, and the beauty of your creation and we praise you for that. We are grateful that we can come together virtually to worship, but we long for the day when we can safely return to this sanctuary. Give us patience as we wait for that time. Your word tells us that when we are weary and carry heavy burdens, we can come to you for comfort and rest and we are here to claim that promise. 
you know that we are weary and we carry heavy burdens. We are on paths we have not walked before, paths leading we know not where. The health of hundreds of thousands of people is in jeopardy. Give your special comfort to those who are ill, to those who have lost loved ones, and to those medical providers who work under difficulties we can only imagine. In addition to overwhelming health issues, recent violent acts in our country have caused many to step forward to demand that this nation act now to fulfill the long-standing promises of equality and fairness for all. Thank you for the courage of those who stand up to claim that right. And thank you for those who claim, hear the claims and struggle to work toward that ideal. Give each of us new determination to create communities that give meaning to the words we have said so many times with liberty and justice for all. We believe we are ready to begin a new chapter in the life of this congregation. We pray for energy and enthusiasm as we do this. Make us creative in our outreach, courageous in our faith, and compassionate to our leaders and to each other. Finally, we would not forget to ask your forgiveness for the myriad ways in which we fail you every day. We pray all these things in the assurance of your promises to us. Amen. Now go forth in peace, have courage, hold on to that which is good, return no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the presence and the power of God's Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the blessing of the Holy Spirit abide with us all. Amen. Amen.